Hello everyone and welcome to SUNUP. I'm Lyndall Stout. Oklahoma producers getting ready to plant wheat should be on the lookout for fall armyworms. Joining us now is Tom Royer, our extension entomologist. And Tom, we just got out here in the field and you spotted some armyworms right away. I did. I ended up, I've had several calls from people that said they went out to a field that they were getting ready to plant and they could go out and see armyworms laying around waiting maybe waiting for them to plant and, and uh, uh, for the, the wheat to come up, and, and that's exactly what we did out here. Um, what I told them is that a lot of times at the edge of a field where we have all this grass, they're already out there and they can move in. Um, fall armyworms don't necessarily like to plant in a bare field with no food, but um, they can move in from all the grassy areas around. And when the wheat's just coming up out of the ground, it's it's uh, really important for producers to to watch and make sure they don't have an early infestation because that can really delay um, their grazing potential of their wheat or um, just you know outright kill it. Give us an idea of what to look for. Well, I just happen to have one right here. Um, it's hungry, obviously, because it's already produced some frass in my hand. But uh, this is about the size that you don't want to see them get any bigger than this because once they start getting a little bit bigger, uh, they're very capable of eating a lot of plant material. And uh, you want to be, and they're also a lot more, less susceptible to insecticides as they are when they're little. So um, we always say if they're less than a half inch long, um, that's when you want to be out spraying for them. But you need to go out and scout for them as well. You know, don't just assume that they're out there because um, you want to be able to use the insecticide effectively. So management wise, that's the first step. Yes, and it's pretty easy to, to sample for them. Uh, just get down, look at a square foot area. Uh, I think our threshold's around two per square foot, two to three per square foot, um, in both in pastures and, and wheat. So if anybody wants to uh, make sure that they have some pasture uh, hay for fall, that they're gonna harvest for fall, they need to be checking for fall armyworms as well. And then in terms of the treatment, what do you recommend? We have, there's a lot of insecticides that are registered for fall armyworm control. Fairly inexpensive and they're pretty effective as long as you're applying them to uh, pretty, the, the tiny caterpillars. Once they get big, they're a lot harder to kill. And with the weather we've had this year, this should be, uh, unlike last year, we should have a better opportunity to get control of them. Let's switch gears a little bit and talk okay. about soybeans. That yeah. crop is maturing and you're getting some que I questions got, as well. Just before we uh, uh, film this, I had two questions on soybean um, caterpillars that are defoliating the soybeans. A lot of times, if the soybeans are in the flowering to pod set time, that's a very critical time uh, to avoid defoliation. Um, our thresholds go down quite a bit. Uh, during that period of time because they're a lot more sensitive to yield loss. So um, in that case, we suggest uh, uh, 15 to 20 percent defoliation is about all you can really tolerate in soybeans with, uh, there's there's a kind of a suite um, of three or four caterpillars that like to, to chew on soybeans. And you just got to make sure that the caterpillars are out there and you have the uh, correct amount of defoliation um, to make that decision. Okay, so that's the that's the guidance there. That's the guidance. Right now, 15 to 20 percent. When I talk to a producer about um, going out and sampling soybeans, it's always important to take leaves from the top, middle, and bottom of the canopy because a lot of insects like to be on the top. And and if you just were to pick leaves off the top, you'd think you had a lot of defoliation. But that plant, if if they have intact leaves in the middle and bottom that aren't defoliated. Um, you can average that defoliation out and then get the correct amount. And, uh, and that's what happens with a lot of producers that aren't used to it. They see the top leaves and they get really panicky, but there's really, a lot of times there's not much, uh, nearly as much defoliation as they think there is. And then in terms of treatment, are there some options at this stage? Absolutely. There's a, it's the same as with wheat. There's a, tr a wide variety of insecticides that are effective. Um, one of the things to keep in mind is that they need to make sure that they still have caterpillars out there because uh, green clover worms in particular are very susceptible to diseases and you can watch a population crash really quickly 
and that means you're not going to have defoliation anymore. And you covered all this in your latest newsletter? Yes, we have. And they're, they're sent out to our county extension educators and the, uh, available for anybody to, to read. Okay, terrific, Tom. Thanks a lot. Okay. And for a link to Tom's newsletter, which goes into more depth, go to sunup.okstate.edu. It won't be long until the fall weaning sales are uh, upon us. Many of those uh, sales coming up will involve some of the value added calf programs, often called VAC 45 programs, where they require that the calves are weaned at least 45 days prior to sale date. Some producers that are raising these calves may wonder why does it have to be that long? Well, there's real good research data that helps us explain this. Iowa State to University several years ago did an extensive study. In fact, it took over nine years to get the data, several thousand head of calves. And they kept track of the records of those calves, whether they had been weaned 30 days or less between the time that they uh, went from the, the ranch to the feedlot or if they had been weaned longer than 30 days. What they found was, was rather significant. The calves that had been weaned less than 30 days, 28% of them had some degree of bovine respiratory disease once they reached the feedlot. Whereas the calves that had been weaned longer than 30 days, only 13% of those calves became sick. Perhaps even more important was that those calves that had been weaned less than 30 days, 6% of them required three or more treatments in order to uh, get over the disease complex that they were encountering. Whereas only 1% of the calves that had been weaned longer than 30 days required three treatments. So this data set, I think, made it pretty clear that we needed to pick a weaning time out here longer than one month so that we have those calves giving them the best chance of moving on to the next segment of the beef industry with a, a lower risk of respiratory disease or other diseases, and if they do become sick, requiring less treatments. We hope this gives you a little better idea of why the value-added calf programs require 45 days between weaning and the sale date to give the, those buyers the best chance to take home a healthy calf that'll do a good job for them and give them a chance to make a profit in the beef industry as well. Hey, we look forward to visiting with you again next week on Sunup's Cow-Calf Corner. Glenn Selk just gave some information about VAC 45 programs and Gantt, VAC 45 is essential to value-added programs. Absolutely, With the, that's kind of the, the, the base of, of any of these value-added uh, vaccine-type programs. Of course, Dave, our um, OQBN VAC 45, the Oklahoma Quality Beef Network VAC 45 program, really um, we've, we've had here at Oklahoma State University since about 2001, mm -hmm. um, so for a really long time. And we've, uh, again, partnered with the Cattlemen's Association to offer um, uh, this program to producers across the state. And, and really, these programs in, in, the, in the VAC 45 cents or any sense, all we are really doing is identifying management practices um, and promoting those at the time of sale. That's, that's really all we're doing, um, increasing information flow um, from a buyer to a, to a seller. That's essentially it. And for someone who may not be familiar with, a, with, with the value added program, this, this is an opportunity to pay a little extra for livestock, but then you also know, know more about it. Yep, absolutely. So, so really what we're doing, we, we set up the, the management requirements, um, um, two rounds of vaccine, um, a good nutrition program, weaned for the 45 days that, that Glenn has, has talked about. Um, and when we do that, 
um, we actually get more gain on those calves and the value gain um, in any um, uh, beef cattle scenario is the most powerful tool we have uh, to add value to those calves. So we increase the weight gain and at times we also increase the value at those, uh, those, those calves at the time of sale. Now, Dave, I, I do want to point out some, some things that we've seen here recently. Um, the terminology has changed a little bit on these calves. We used to talk about um, getting a, a $10 premium um, per hundredweight for those calves. But really, to be perfectly honest with you, for the last 18 months to, to really almost two years now, these VAC 45 well-managed reputation calves are now the baseline meaning that the unweaned ball and calf going through the sale barn, they're the ones receiving a discount and up to 10 to $15 a hundred a discount versus the, the VAC 45 calves uh, or, or the reputation type calves going through the, through the auction right now. Those cattle are, are, are being weaned right now for sale dates coming up soon. Yep, absolutely. Uh, it's a great point. Um, uh, Cherokee um, is our first sale, seems to be always our, our first sale, and that weaning date is actually September 10. Mm -hmm. um, so we got to get those calves pulled off uh, off the mama cow and start that weaning process. Um, and then Woodward will be right behind Cherokee, followed by a, a, a whole list of, uh, of sales after that. So um, if you do want to participate in our program, um, if you meet the management requirements, myself or a county agent will come out and, and take a look at those calves. Um, you're not obligated to market your cattle. Uh, in one of our sales, we want you to have the flexibility to, to market your cattle however you want to, but it does help if, if we can get a lot of those calves in one location, um, it really helps on, on price. So those buyers can put truckloads of calves together. Um, maybe, maybe we have a, a farmer that, that needs some cattle for wheat pasture, which uh, I think we know this year the prospects for wheat pasture are looking pretty good. Um, so if we can get those calves in one location, it, it does help with value. And this year, there, there's actually another step that's being taken. There, there's some management tools available too. Absolutely, we have partnered with uh, Micro Technologies, um, and and they're allowing us to use uh, a Stalker One um, uh, herd management software. It's it's a it's a specifically for Stalker cattle. Um, and so what we're going to do is, is we're going to put the information of those calves into that program, the, how we managed them, uh, the, the days weaned, whatever information we can glean from, from the ranch, we're going to put in that program. And whoever purchases those calves and is using the Stalker One program, they'll already have those calves preloaded and we'll be able to, to pull out how many times they've been treated, um, how they were managed in, in the Stalker setting. And we're going to try to at least um, have the initial step of, of tracking those calves and, and tracking the health of those calves. Okay, thank you much, Gant Mauer. And for more information on the OQBN program and weaning, weaning dates, you can go to our website, setup.okstate.edu. seen the video and pictures coming out of Houston from Hurricane Harvey's torrential rain. As you keep those folks in your thoughts and prayers, include all those in smaller communities and on farms and ranches impacted by these historic rains. On a four-day rainfall map from 4.15 p.m. August 25th to 4.15 p.m. August 29th, produced by the West Gulf River Forecast Center, locations in the pink areas had 30 or more inches of rain. Purple areas were over 15 inches. On Wednesday, August 30th, a map of stream gauges showed how widespread the flooding was. Waterways at various stages of flooding ran from Corpus Christi, Texas to Lafayette, Louisiana. Turning to rainfall in Oklahoma, yellow bright colored areas were areas of high rainfall on a 14-day map from August 16th to August 30th. Oklahoma City East collected 7 and 7900 inches of rain over those 14 days.
In Washita County, radar rainfall estimates indicated a large area with rain amounts over six inches. Green areas received more than an inch and as much as three inches of rain. Blue areas received less than an inch of rain. Soils in the blue areas showed that lack of rainfall. They are the brown and yellow areas. Here's Gary with a look at Oklahoma's drought status and August rainfall. Thanks, Alan. Good morning, everyone. Well, we're finally done with August, and what an August it was. Definitely a different variety than what we're used to around here, right? Well, let's take a look at some of the maps, and I'll show you why August was so different than our previous August. Now, as always, we got to start out with the drought map. Um, again, we continue with just those abnormally dry conditions, very small spots in central Oklahoma and then up centered around my hometown of Buffalo, Oklahoma and Harper County in the Northwest. Sort of concerned about that area. Um, I'll show you why here in a minute, but uh, most of the state free and clear of any drought or dry conditions thanks to the enormous amounts of rainfall we had. So from that, let's go right to the rainfall map from the Mesonet for the month of August. Now, as you look at those wonderful looking colors and numbers across the map, know that there was a little bit of flooding, so it wasn't perfect, but we did end up with the second wettest August on record with the statewide average of about 6.42 inches. That's nearly 3.4 inches above normal. Um, and our totals range from about 13 inches at the Oklahoma City East Mesonet site. And then up there at Buffalo, they only had 1.55 inches. Remember, that's where that abnormally dry is centered on the drought monitor. Um, and if we look at the departure from normal for August, um, again, most of the state above normal to well above normal. Uh, again, parts of Oklahoma City, 10 inches above normal for the month of August. But there's Buffalo up in the, the far northwest at 1.1 inches below normal. So we're dealing with deficits up there. Um, it's a very tiny part of the state, but it's an area that we could see drought uh, develop and move up into Kansas and connect with that area uh, if we're not careful. So we did manage to get rid of drought during the summer months uh, before our secondary rainy season in the fall. So any uh, rainfall we get from September, October, into November is what we call gravy, right? Uh, that's it for this time. We'll see you next time on the Mesonet Weather Report. It is officially college football season, and that is the theme for Kim this week. And Kim, it appears that Russia ran the opening kickoff for a touchdown this year. Tell us about that. Well, if you look at uh, Russian wheat production, you, five year average, 10 year average is just over 2 billion bushels. Uh, this year, they're going to harvest at least a 3 billion bushel crop and maybe a 3.1 billion bushel. That's, that's a 33% increase in production uh, this year over the average. Uh, you look at the quality of that Russian wheat, they're easily shipping 12 and a half protein wheat and meeting the, that export demand. So uh, they've got some good players out there to, to uh, play this game with. And reports also show that Russia has a quality set of receivers. Oh yes, uh, when you look at the uh, short uh, the short game uh, into North Africa, Egypt, uh, they're shipping into there and they're, they're controlling that market. But for the first time ever, they've sold and delivering wheat into Venezuela. Uh, they've uh, contracted for uh, uh, cargoes of uh, 1.1 million already uh, uh, shipped and got them uh, cleared to go. Uh, the reports say they've got an agreement to, to deliver 2.2 million bushels a month to Venezuela over the next year. Now that no market normally belongs to the U.S. and Canada. We normally uh, move 4.4 uh, million bushels into Venezuela and we're probably going to lose half of that this year. Let's talk about France. I've heard they also have a good team this year. Yes, their their uh, crop is uh, significantly bigger than last year. You know, last year they had a disaster. This year they got good production and they got good quality. A report say that 92% of that wheat is 11.5% protein or better, and that's soft red wheat, not hard red wheat. That's soft red wheat, and that the milling characteristics on it are are excellent. So uh, looks like uh, France has a, a good a good team this year to uh, meet that domestic and export demand. Okay, let's talk about how the Canadian team is shaping up. 
Well, they're a little short this year. Uh, the drought, just like in northern U.S. on that, that hard spring wheat, uh, the drought reduced the yield on that, but the quality is relatively good. So they've got good quality, a, sh a shortage of products. So they're uh, their exports will probably be down a little bit, uh, but uh, they're going to be playing the game with those good quality players. And then in terms of the U.S. and their reaction to all this competition? Oh, we're hurting because, you know, we had a w total wheat production a little over 1.7 billion bushels compared to 2.3 billion last year. Plus, you look at Oklahoma's uh, hard red winter wheat protein level, 10.8, 10.9 on the average. The millers need, oh, 11.4 to 11.6. Uh, so uh, you, you look at our quality and you look at our quality, uh, they're both down, down this year along with our price. And that's... That's just not that's just not good. And then with all this in mind, what should the recruiting strategy be for players for the next season? Well, if you're looking at 2018, 19 marketing year, I think we need to concentrate on quality and quantity. I think we, you know, our problem uh, is that our protein is lower. Uh, we've got good milling characteristics, but our protein is low. So I think we need to concentrate on a good protein. If we can have protein, I think our prices will go from that 320 level. We're now up to at least 450 and maybe five dollars. But we've got to have those quality players before we can stay in this game. And remain optimistic, right? And remain optimistic. Okay, Kim, thanks a lot. We'll see you next week. Today we want to talk a little bit about PTO shafts, U-joints, and a transition from standard uh, SAE uh, systems into more metric systems. So, you know, it used to be we had the SAE system, which is the inch system, and your U-joints would be measured and you'd get an inch unit. But nowadays, with all the PTO shafts coming from Europe, we are, we're transitioning to metric uh, type PTO shafts. And the way you tell those is typically on a, on a metric shaft, it's going to have some type of lobe around it. Generally, you know, most of our U.S. shafts that we would have would just be square. There's going to be a piece of square tubing, maybe uh, uh, hexagonal or something like that. But uh, the metric ones are either going to be kind of uh, oblong cross section with some lobes on it or triangular like this with some lobes on it. Yeah, they'll, they'll have some type of, of odd shape to them, typically as compared to the American unit. And then the, the reason you need to know that is if you ever have to replace your U-joint crosses, then you need to be able to measure them and see what particular size you need, and that's going to be metric. I mean, you can't just round it up nowadays to what you think is, is uh, what is the SAE standard. You just, you'd have to actually go with a metric unit. So. You need to know what the cross section of the shaft looks like, and that's going to tell you if you have a metric or a standard U-joint, uh, and then you need to measure the U-joint to determine what size it is. Okay, and, and when you're doing these U-joints, there's, um, it's, it's kind of like hitches. We have categories of hitches. You also have series of, of U-joints in ag, and, and so there's different series. Make sure you have the right series of U-joint for the shaft for the horsepower needs you're going to require. So make sure you know what you need when you're going to replace something on your, U, on your uh, PTO shaft or any shaft that's running a U-joint. That's it this week on Shop Stop. We'll see you next week. Finally today, Extension Livestock Entomologist Justin Talley with the insect that lives for waste in pastures. We're trying to figure out if dung beetles are around in Oklahoma pastures. The kind of pastures that we want to look at are improved pastures versus native pastures. We have a lot of producers that have both of those types of pastures and our sampling plan is fairly simple. We just put cups with uh, dung in it and the particular dung that dung beetles really like is pig dung so we'll put a little cup of pig dung in and then we put some soapy water into uh, a one liter cup and uh, and as the dung beetles are attracted to it they fall into that uh, soapy water and they can't get out. Uh, we actually uh, want to see the difference uh, here like we have a lot of pastures and, and different treatments so we're trying to see if there's any uh, difference in the community of dung beetles and here we have five 
different species. The big one and I think the most beautiful one. <laughs> yes, they are beautiful and cute too. Look this, it's like a jewel. <laughs> dung beetles are very important. They're what we call an ecosystem service provider. They're, they're gonna take that dung from that cow and incorporate it back into the soil. They also can uh, reduce parasites, both external parasites such as hornflies and internal parasites. Dung beetles are just a small part of a larger project that uh, we're, we're doing many things on, but mainly looking at fly control. And what we're trying to figure out is if we can look at these and see if consumption rate of the mineral as well as in different types of pasture can affect uh, fly loads on those animals. Well, our number one external parasite for beef cattle across the U.S. is considered horn flies. Uh, horn flies are small flies on the back and on the side of your animals. Uh, July and August are usually our critical months for Oklahoma cattle producers. So we will have a lot of those flies. And if you just want to consider the impact of horn flies to either a stalker system or a cow-calf system, it's the impact to weight performance. And so essentially how we measure that, we, we can measure weaning weights or end weights and stalkers, and then uh, relate that back to fly treatment and fly load. Usually our fly loads are what we consider economic when it's above 200 and we get well over above 200 horn flies per animal in, in April. Research is one of the, the focal points of what we try to do and, uh, to, and the way we do it is to try to make it very applied so we can take it back to producers and share that with them. Thanks so much for joining us this week. Remember you can find us anytime on our website sunup.okstate.edu and also follow us on YouTube and social media. We leave you today with a few snapshots from county fairs around Oklahoma. I'm Lyndall Stout, we'll see you next time at SUNUP.